My name is Brian Applegarth. I'm the founder and the executive director of the CCTA. We were established in 2017 and we work to promote the development of safe and responsible cannabis tourism, unify the cannabis and the travel industries, advocate for enabling regulatory environments, and promote best practices in the space with a unified cannabis tourism voice. Our three core pillars are advocacy, education, and networking. So we wanted to start out really talking about cannabis tourism markets that currently already exist. And we took a look at Amsterdam as well as Colorado, and we wanted to share uh, three kind of data points that we, that we collected. Um, as far as Amsterdam, uh, you can take a second and kind of review these and read through them, and I'm gonna to speak to them here while we do that. But the Dutch Tourist Information Office reported that essentially one in four people that visit Amsterdam actually visit a cannabis coffee shop. So it's part of the destination experience and part of the visitor draw for that market. 10% um, of those travelers actually willingly cite that visiting a cannabis coffee shop in Amsterdam um, was a primary reason for their visitation to the destination. Um, when we look at Colorado recently did some research um, in the last two or three years. And when we look at Colorado, they looked at it kind of seasonally. They looked at both the winter season and the summer season travel. And across both, it pretty much averaged out to between 15 and 16 percent of the cannabis interested travelers that came to Colorado visited a, uh, um, a marijuana dispensary store while visiting, 15 to 16 percent of visitors. Um, also, they did a demographic shift into cannabis motivated audience. And they noticed that that audience spends more and stays longer in destinations, which really ties back to the economic impact that tourism has. Um, and as normalization grows, we'll continue to grow. So what is cannabis tourism? We really wanted to pause kind of up front here and let us all get in the right kind of mind space and start imagining what cannabis tour tourism is currently, where it came from to now and what it's going to be like going forward. And to really understand cannabis tourism in California, you have to start with medical legalization in 1996. In 1996, Proposition 215 passed, and that was the first time we saw the medical traveler really start arriving in California. Now, cannabis played a vital role on the front lines of the AIDS epidemic, and then other research came out about glaucoma and even helping with nausea and, and cancer treatments. And, this kind of underground medical traveler started arriving in California to access cannabis. It was a gray market, um, kind of quasi legal market, uh, but that was the first we saw kind of medical travelers showing up. And then between 1996 and 2018, you had this market that was the medical marijuana market of California called the Compassionate Use Act. Compassionate use, you may have heard that term recently. They're using that term with COVID-19 right now in creating medications to address the pandemic. It was the same thing during the AIDS epidemic. So the Compassionate Use Act really um, positioned cannabis as uh, at what it has been for, for generations, which is a medical application, and that drew visitors to our state. Now, between 1996 and 2018 in this quasi-legal market, um, you had people started arriving as well that were business-minded. They saw that cannabis was on a trajectory to eventually go legal, and people started showing up and wanting to learn more about the industry. Um, in 2007, in Oakland, California, actually Oaksterdam University started, which is kind of the most well-known cannabis college is right here in Northern California. Um, so you have this kind of business traveler or even cannabis enthusiast that relocated to California to get involved in the medical marijuana market between 1996 and 2018. And then when you hit 2018, you have the adult use medical legalization, or excuse me, the adult use uh, market, which is essentially the recreational cannabis market, some refer to as. And this is where anyone 21 and up is able to legally purchase and consume cannabis. It has regulations, testing standards, and it really starts attracting more of a leisure traveler. Now, another interesting um, pivot that happened in 2018 directly ties into the efficacious testing standard of the regulated cannabis industry we have today, um, which essentially is, um, is a tier of the supply chain 
that ensures that the products that you buy from a licensed dispensary in California is tested for parts per billion, which is a very severe testing standard. So they know the medicine is clean, um, that there's no kind of pollutants in it or, or things that are bad for you. So, you know, even now the medical tourism draw does exist. It's not fully recognized. I know leisure is a lot of the focus, but this medical draw as well, especially with the testing standards of the legal cannabis adult use market um, continues to speak to the medical traveler. So it was important to just kind of go through that process from 96 to now to understand that there's a medical traveler, a business traveler, and a leisure traveler. Now, this list of cannabis tourism is just some of the current offerings that exist in our state. You know, obviously, agritourism, cannabis is a plant, it is a crop. Um, cannabis largely leans into wellness, which is why that is highlighted. You know, cannabis is used as a tool to um, promote well-being. Um, as long as the dosing is correct and it's grown the right way and it's clean, it is very much in line with wellness. Um, there's guided tours that are operated daily from San Diego up to Humboldt. We have uh, a handful of members that are in that space of the CCTA. A real exciting evolution is the California Cannabis Appalachians. There's been a lot of great work done by the CDFA, the Mendocino Appalachians Project, the International Cannabis Farmers Association. There's groups that are working on building the Cannabis Appalachians of California. And right now uh, they're building out kind of the regulatory framework of what that looks like. You also have CBD massage and spa services. A really cool product we have in California is the prohibition storytelling, just like the tunnels to, you know, the liquor and the beer smuggling that happened. Um, we have infused dining experiences where people have curated dinners and they're walked through not only the food and how cannabis is used in the food, but where it comes from and which Appalachian or which part of the state that the flower is grown and who grows it and how they grow it and also how they cure it, which we'll get to later on. Um, you have cannabis lounges popping up. There's some in Mendocino. There's some in San Francisco. There's some that are down in, in Palm Springs. There's one that opened outside of Santa Barbara. So you have these kind of communal consumption spaces that are emerging as well as a cafe that popped up in West Hollywood. And we are just at the beginning uh, and really frankly need to move quicker with creating consumption areas for people and communicating around what that means and where people can use cannabis confidently and know it's safe and legal. Obviously, with cannabis, you have guided pairings and tastings. You have creative kind of endeavors like puff and paint, um, visiting a cannabis shop, just like the Amsterdam data point showed. People are curious to actually go into a legal retail experience and see what that feels like and know and understand it. Um, immersive edutainment, you know, in this early phase, a lot of people are focused on education and wanting more information around cannabis, hemp and CBD. So being kind of over investing on education for people is uh, is important. You also have the connoisseur, which goes into a whole line of concentrates and other kind of products with cannabis. People get really geeky about kind of what type of concentrate it is, how it's sourced, there's live resin, there's what is the efficacy, is it single source? Um, and cannabis, one reason it's so complicated is because it, it really tentacles out into a lot of different products and different, and it speaks to a lot of different audiences. In California too, we have the cannabis movement that happened right here for medical legalization, which really, you know, we already have that tourism asset, which is the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. And that talks about that cannabis story. What's not told is the story of the back to the land movement and the migration up north and living off the land and communities off the grid. And it's as compelling and interesting. So when you start learning about you know, the, the movement of cannabis, including what happened in San Francisco with the epidemic, which was the platform that allowed it to be medical legalized, you start kind of seeing this California story emerge of marginalized groups and cannabis is threaded throughout. It also kind of dates back to the beatniks. So there's an opportunity to breathe some new life into that storytelling as well. And we all know how important storytelling is um, to, uh, to, for marketing, to bring people here and want to experience something. Um, of course, that ties into culture. And last but not least is events. You know, the Emerald Cup, which is one of the, if not the premier cannabis event in California um, in, in December will draw, it will bring in about 17 to $20 million um, in direct spending to Sonoma County. 
And uh, there's a big opportunity for cannabis events to be an economic driver for destinations. All right, this slide's just more inspirational kind of photographs, really kind of showing you the diversity that cannabis and CBD tourism has. You know, upper left corner there, you have Dennis Perone and Brownie Mary. Uh, that's, a, that's a story in itself, that's, but that's part of the culture and the historical movement and storytelling. You know, obviously yoga, meditation, mindfulness, spa treatment, CBD infused massages. You see the two gentlemen taking a selfie in a, in a cannabis cultivation area. And then of course the photo on the right with a group enjoying kind of a family style fine dining um, course meal that's probably cannabis infused or CBD infused where you have the chef as well as a sommelier there um, to walk them through the experience and make sure they understand the dosing and the effects and use it kind of as, a, as an edutainment, an educational tool. Um, and it can be inhalation or non-inhalation. So we'll get to that as well, but there's a lot of different types of products and ways to curate. All right, great. So I'm sure most of us have heard of the Emerald Triangle region of Northern California. Um, so the Emerald Triangle is a three county region um, up in, it's, it's north of, of Sonoma, it's, it's Humboldt, Mendocino and Trinity County. And it's really famous for world-class cannabis. It's a region where small farmers have been perfecting their cannabis craft for generations, not only underground, but many of them off the grid and really people that value low impact on the land. So there's really interesting methods of agriculture and farming that have come out of the underground cannabis community that they're extremely excited to build into the tourist experience, get people's hands in the dirt and teach them how to create these ecosystems that are built on biodiversity and regenerative agriculture and these other terms that are part of the cannabis cultivation uh, culture. And um, I wanna thank Flocana. Flocana is the largest distributor in California and they support these legacy small farmers. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, which is cannabis consumption and dosing, cannabis 2.0. Cannabis has come a long way. Um, so really cannabis 2.0 goes beyond the inhalation style of consumption, which is still a core part of the cannabis industry and the cannabis culture. But in this new evolution, there's all kinds of products. This is just a simple slide showing that, you know, for tourism, for, for tourists and visitors to our state, you know, there's going to be many options of how they're able to consume cannabis. There's drinkables, there's edibles, there's topicals, there's transdermal patches, there's intimacy products, there's sleep chocolates. There's all certain, uh, there's all different kinds of products that are largely based in effect. And that's what really makes cannabis interesting is it's an effect based product. So, you know, comparable, not necessarily to the buzz of wine but it, cannabis has its own quote unquote buzz that has a different feel. And it can really lean into creativity or intimacy um, or other effect feelings. And then it's really about getting the dosing correct. And every day we're getting better and better on the dosing. And this is largely with the THC molecule that, that's a little more controversial because it's a psychoactive component of cannabis. But there's many different dosing options um, there's different kinds of products and also the packaging is going mainstream. So as you see in this photo, there's all sorts of packages and brands. You have brands like Francis Ford Coppola, like Lagunitas beer that are now rolling out their cannabis lines. So the sophistication is increasing and it's going to make it more accessible because it's relatable to the new consumer. All right, great. So this is a simple slide, it's Globe Trender, which essentially does travel trend forecasts. And it just shows that there's been quite a lot, there's been quite a bit of media coverage the past kind of tw uh, 12 months to two years around cannabis and CBD tourism and how it's becoming a more sophisticated kind of uh, uh, destination product that's appealing to luxury leaning travelers as well as budget travelers, uh, speaks to a lot of different audiences. Um, they rank number nine for the 2020 travel trend forecasts. We've also seen cannabis tourism be covered in Forbes, Wine Enthusiast, uh, the Travel Channel, and other mainstream outlets. That just shows that it's, that it's becoming further and further normalized and is something that we should look at um, with more attention as we are in our third year of legalization here in California. And that's also a close-up of a cannabis flower. So cannabis is actually a flowering plant and there's lots of different kinds of cultivars or varietals of cannabis. There's high CBD, 
there's ones that are kind of more balanced, like 10%, 10% CBD to THC. And then there's ones that go through the roof up to 30 plus percent of THC count. And yet again, these cultivars, just like varietals of wine, have like different balance, taste, mouth feel. These cultivars of cannabis, which is the, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the word for cannabis cultivar is like synonym to wine varietal is it really leans into different kinds of effects as well as smells. So it's going to be a really complex plant and really fun to curate those experiences in tourism. Next slide, please. All right, so the CCTA really, we live at the intersection of the tourism industry and the cannabis industry. And we really work to build bridges. Um, and since we started in 2017, the goal was to really get a seat at the table with the travel industry of the state and start educating and normalizing and just working toward cannabis being understood. So different destinations and stakeholders could figure out how cannabis, hemp or CBD could fit into their destination and speak to an audience. Um, so this is two kind of high level definitions. The tourism industry is travel for pleasure or business. It's the practice of touring and the business of attracting, accommodating and entertaining visitors, travelers and tourists. And the cannabis industry refers to all activities and professionals that are involved directly or in an ancillary role to the legal production, transport, say, uh, sale and consumption of cannabis or hemp, as well as the product services and experiences derived from or centered around them. So the convergence of these two industries is where the CCTA lives. Um, we engage consistently with the California Hotel and Lodging Association, Cal Travel Association, Visit California, you know, I consider those three groups to really kind of carry the torch for California tourism. And we are a resource to them as well as our members in helping build bridges and creating opportunities and educating um, so we can uh, so we can understand what we have with cannabis in California as a California destination asset for market to market. Um, so I wanted to speak a little bit more to the difference between uh, Cal Travel and Visit California and the California Hotel and Lodging Association. So the California Hotel and Lodging Association basically helps address the diverse needs of the hotel and hospitality industry in the state of California. Visit California is the marketing organization that works to drive visitation to California. It's basically kind of an economic development vehicle with tourism. Um, and then the California Travel Association is the united voice of the California's travel and tourism industry. And their mission is to protect and advance the travel and tourism industry's interest. So there's a lot of advocacy um, that happens under Cal Travel. So for example, last year, uh, we, we actually were in Sacramento as part of the lobby day or the advocacy day with Cal Travel. Um, and the year before that, the CCTA actually showed up independently and took meetings to make people aware that we were here and this is what our mission was. Okay, so we have a few more data points here. This is really focused around California's tourism industry and how important it is. You know, nearly 145 billion in travel related spending in 2019 in California. You know, another important data point here is the fourth one down. You'll notice that six out of every $10 spent in visitor destinations was attributable to out of state or international visitation. So essentially, this shows the case that tourism is an economic driver and incredibly relevant for the state of California. All right, wonderful. Now, here's California's cannabis industry and why this is relevant. So, you know, a couple other data points retail sales grew from 2.5 to 3.1 uh, billion in 2019. And the traditional market sold an estimated 8.1 billion in 2019. Now that statistic is interesting because the traditional market is essentially the black market. Um, I know there's sensitivity around the use of that word, but that shows the gap and kind of the battle that's upon the regulated market to really try to capture more consumers and bring them into licensed retail shops buying safe tested medicine and the ccta really works to steward that as well and support the regulated market um, another data point here is the cannabis industry impact could be nearly 10 million by 2022 and cannabis and hemp derived cbd products combined could reach 20 billion in sales by 2024 and it's one of the fastest growing segments 
So this just shows the economic relevance of the cannabis and the CBD and hemp industry. Now, I want to point out that CBD is an interesting term because it really overlaps between the hemp and the cannabis industry. Um, and you have different types of CBD products from full spectrum to broad spectrum to isolate. And I've even heard live spectrum is a new category that's growing. Um, so, you know, the cannabis industry and the hemp industry, along with the CBD craze, um, is, is continues to trend up and having that merge in with California cannabis tourism, again, is our mission and something worth discussing and moving forward. So, you know, this slide, I really wanted just to acknowledge that tourism in California and travel, there's really an ecosystem that is established from market to market, including throughout the state. You have hotels, attractions, restaurants. Um, you have, you know, air, everything from Airbnbs, bed and breakfasts. You have different types of museums. And there's certain markets and certain operators or businesses within those markets where speaking to the visitation and the tourist to their market is a core part of their business model. And we're in a phase right now where cannabis operators that understand this opportunity can can, can, can build bridges and educate and reach out and find their spot within that tourism ecosystem, which, which is already in place. Um, you'll notice to the right of the slide, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a portion that shows the DMOs, which is the destination, the destination, DMO stands for destination marketing organization. And essentially each destination from San Francisco to Palm Springs, to San Diego, to Oxnard, has their destination pillars of kind of what they, how they position as a destination for travelers. And the question is, how is cannabis and CBD and hemp gonna exist market by market throughout the state? Um, and then the DMO is largely similar to what Visit California does for the state of California. The DMOs in each market or the CVBs, they try to attract visitation by marketing within their pillars of their destination to get people to visit and spend money and experience the culture and come visit. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out and really paint the picture of that with lounges, deliveries, as well as cannabis shops, and of course, tour companies and infused dinners and the list we had prior, you know, there's a lot of ways to plug in for people who are interested in, in being part of this cannabis tourism evolution. We're gonna dive now into the uh, core pillar of the CCTA is advocacy. So this is an advocacy update. It's the last three kind of initiatives that we worked on. Um, the most recent one is we signed on to a funding request that was spearheaded by Cal Travel, um, which is basically requesting 45 million allocation for Visit California to run a marketing campaign as the state reopens and gets Californians back traveling and back to work. Um, so I think that was actually submitted yesterday or today, and the CCTA is right there alongside the other kind of tourism stakeholders throughout the state. Um, a few months back, prior to COVID, we, uh, we put some energy into trying to breathe some new life into SB 625. Now, SB 625 originally was a bill that would permit cannabis charter party carriers um, provided that the vehicle was equipped with appropriate ventilation standards to assure that the drivers are not exposed to secondhand smoke. So it was an effort to allow the inhalation component of the of of, of tours, cannabis tourism to exist um, on a vehicle. And there are tour companies that were kind of first movers in the market that invested in, in retrofitting or building out their vehicles to accommodate this as it was written. Um, which now it's on shaky ground and all but off the table. So we're going to pick that back up once we're past COVID, but we see an opportunity here to have some of the operators who are members of the CCTA to uh, potentially uh, put forth an option of having them grandfathered in in a certain limited number of people who were operating prior. And then also opening up the conversation of, you know, what about drinkables? What about edibles? What about these other uh, consumption methods that aren't inhalation based and being able to use those on carriers. So those are, that, that's SB6 or 625 speaks to that. Um, also recently, the CCTA submitted um, comments around the proposed app Appalachians, cannabis Appalachians. Um, so the CDFA put those out. It went through a comment period. We had three comments that we submitted. One was a TOR based system. Essentially, we recommended reconsidering creating a structure that was more deeply focused 
on terroir, including the unique impact of the earth, sun, and air, and, uh, and, and the differentiating factors um, in cannabis cultivars. Um, the second point was labeling. And we recommended that an Appalachian and a county of uh, a county of origin be prominently displayed on a label, um, working toward marketing and really thinking of the inter- international market. And what does that sound like when people want to buy the you know the best California bud or, or 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 pot or cannabis from Humboldt or Mendocino or Trinity County? Um, and then the third comment we submitted was about the cost of petition and the amendment fee. Um, essentially, it was twenty thousand plus dollars for the petition, the Appalachian petition, to, and then it was ten thousand plus dollars to simply make an amendment every single time. Um, so we came in and, and basically stated that we feel the fees were excessive, that they created unfair financial barriers, essentially for the small legacy cannabis farmers. Um, and that we recommended that the fees be lowered or reconsidered depending on kind of a sliding scale on how big uh, the outfit was. Um, Also, I'll get to this later, but we have set up a new Slack channel that you're all gonna be invited to that has these comments and a lot of the other documents that I'll be walking through where you can look at them in greater detail. All right, the second pillar is networking of the CCTA. So essentially we try to foster an environment where our members can network together and they can network with the, you know, uh, with, with other organizations, things like that opportunities. Um, when I first envisioned the CCTA, it was 50% membership from the travel tourism industry, 50% membership kind of from the cannabis industry and trying to have a blend so we could have really great conversations and have different points of view and be educating each other, uh, in a very reciprocal way. All right, I'd like to welcome Amanda Ryman um, as our featured guest today, also on the board of, of the CCTA. She's the VP of Community Development of Flocana. Well, welcome, welcome. Thank, thank you for being our uh, special guest today, Amanda. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. And thanks, everyone, for joining. I have to say, watching who's all in the room, it's like so many of people that I love from the <laughs> cannabis world. Um, so I'm so glad that you all are here. Right on. Hey, Amanda, will you just kind of give some background? You've been in the movement a long time. You know, I I just love for you to give this audience is largely from the travel industry as well. So if you could just kind of give some context of who you are and your role in in the kind of the cannabis movement to now and then what you do for Flocana, that'd be great. Uh, Sure. So um, I'm a public health researcher and social worker by training, and I started studying the cannabis industry and movement when I was getting my PhD at Berkeley in social welfare back in 2005. Uh, So I did my doctoral dissertation on how medical cannabis dispensaries were operating as community health service providers. And I think that that's important because uh, folks who don't remember or weren't really involved back then, the dispensaries really played a huge role in community connection. And I think that that's important when we talk about tourism now, because it's really what is at the heart of California cannabis. So I think that that is, uh, that was something that I I noticed early on was very, very unique about the California cannabis atmosphere. Um, And then after I graduated, I continued to teach at Berkeley, but I started working for Berkeley Patients Group um, as their head of research and patient services to continue to do research, um, looking at things like cannabis substitution. And then they got uh, shut down by the federal government in 2012. Yeah. And so then I I left there and I went to work for the Drug Policy Alliance as their manager of marijuana law and policy. Um, And, you know, my focus has always been the relationship between cannabis and everything else around it. Um, It's really the relationships that I'm most interested in. Uh, So after legalization, I had an opportunity to move up to the Emerald Triangle, uh, to Mendocino County, to work with Flocana on uh, creating centralized distribution uh, for small, independently owned cannabis farms up in this region. So again, the community aspect was really taking front and center, which is my jam. I mean, that's what I love to do. So I came up here to work uh, in community development. And again, you know, not just the cannabis, but the cannabis and everything else. And I think that's why the tourism is so interesting 
interesting to me because it's really an opportunity to bridge cannabis with so many other uh, wonderful things about California that I think can really be a unique draw uh, for folks. Thanks, Amanda. So, you know, the Emerald Triangle region of Northern California is often spoke about like it's the Bordeaux, right? The Bordeaux of cannabis. And it's a world-class producing region. It's a place of source. And what role do you feel like this region will play in the California tourism landscape in the future? Well, I think that there's kind of a two-stage outcome there. At first is what we can do when California can only produce and consume weed in California, right? So there's definitely a barrier to realizing the full potential of the Emerald Triangle and the Appalachian systems until we can ship it outside of California. So I think that, you know, step one is the development relations, which, you know, we're working on. And then it's really thinking about the brand of the Emerald Triangle as a region. So thinking about not just the individual counties, but the ethos of the area and how we turn that into a brand. Uh, and then I think, you know, putting that brand out there and marketing that brand uh, is going to be really important. Um, we're going to, people are going to want to come here to experience what's so unique about uh, cannabis production in the Emerald Triangle, along with everything else the Emerald Triangle has to offer, which is so unique. Um, so there is a potential there, but I think, you know, until we can actually share the product with people in Michigan and with people in Nebraska and with people in Virginia, we're only going to be able to capitalize on a small portion of the full potential of the Emerald Triangle region. Wonderful. So is the culture and history of the California cannabis movement important to include as part of the visitor experience for people interested in experiencing California cannabis? And if so, why? So, yes, of course. I mean, the culture and the history of ca cannabis in California is a cornerstone of cannabis tourism. And without it, honestly, I feel like the tourism experience would be pretty much an empty shell. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, we owe it to them. We owe it to the folks who stuck their necks out and got arrested and put everything on the line for us to have a cannabis industry. So having a discussion about cannabis in California without including them in their stories, um, I would never, I mean, that would be very disrespectful to people who have worked so hard to make this happen. Um, and then I also think that from a consumer point of view, connection and story is what makes something real for someone. And I grew up in Chicago and I grew up going to museums there, uh, the Museum of Science and Industry and the Field Museum. And what really brought those museums to life were experiential opportunities. So opportunities to have visceral context and visceral experiences that really brought the history to life. And it connected with you on a very personal way. And I feel like in here in California, what we have that a lot of states don't have when it comes to cannabis history is that really big emotional connection to the plant and what it has meant. So to have a tourism industry in California that doesn't include opportunities to learn about the past isn't, again, doing a service to what it means to be involved in cannabis in California. And it's also losing out on a really big opportunity to change hearts and minds about cannabis. So one of the opportunities I've always seen for cannabis tourism in California is to invite people from prohibition states to come here and experience cannabis in a beautiful, spiritual, highly connected, safe way. And that the cannabis tourism industry in California was almost a gatekeeper to that experience. And that folks could come here and they could just eat, you know, a thousand milligrams of THC and have a marine doubt experience and be in their hotel room freaking out and go back to Iowa and talk about how legalization was the worst thing that's ever happened any place. Or they could come and go to a beautiful farm and get to put their hands in the dirt and get to have a lightly infused meal and get to tour some lounges and, you know, really learn about cannabis and go back to, you know, wherever they're from and talk about what a wonderful experience it was and question why they have prohibition in their state. And that's a really powerful tool when people feel it inside. And that's what 
sharing the culture of cannabis in California will do with tourism if we do it right. I agree. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people just coming and accidentally taking too much because the communication and the kind of information campaigns just aren't there yet. And really hoping that we can move that forward here in 2020 and 2021 to give visitors the information they need to be able to have that right dose and that right experience here if they decide to use THC uh, and go beyond the CBD massage that they're already doing. Absolutely. So, about Flocana, you know, you guys have a great property in South Mendo. It's kind of the gateway to this region. So I'm curious what the vision is, what's for the future of tourism, you know, according to Flocana and what they intend, how they intend to reach visitors that are coming to our state. Well, I, you know, as we're going to talk about in the next section around COVID, you know, there's definitely some reimagining that's happening when we think about what the future of tourism is going to be, at least in the short to medium term, and what kind of experiences people are going to want to have. And, you know, before I, I talk more about Flocana's vision, uh, one of the things I've been doing recently is doing interviews with tourism operators in the space to get a better sense of how they're pivoting during COVID and what they see for the future. And even though, you know, finance is definitely a, a concern and a barrier moving forward. Um, what I'm hearing is almost a bigger barrier is the psychology around travel and what people are going to be comfortable with and what they're not going to be comfortable with. And so there's a big conversation to be had when we talk about the future of tourism, about what is going to feed into people's fears and what is going to make them feel better. And so one of the things we have going for us in the Emerald Triangle, of course, are these beautiful wide open spaces. Uh, we're not a congested area. There's lots of room for people to hike and for people to camp and still maintain safe social distancing. So all of that being said, when we think about the future of tourism and what Flocana would like to see, you know, I think we are of the mindset, you know, come for the cannabis, stay for the regenerative agriculture. Like we see this as an opportunity to hook people in with an interest in cannabis and in, you know, seeing cannabis farms, but then using that as an opportunity to talk about sustainable and environmentally sound cultivation of food in general and of plants in general. Uh, Mendocino County banned GMOs a long time ago. They were the first place to take that step. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they have capped their farms at 10,000 square feet, although that might change, um, you know, has shown what they view as special about the way people farm here. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, of course, with the Solar Living Center property that you were referring to in Hopland, it's an opportunity to have a demonstration garden and to have gardening classes and to allow people to come up, get their hands in the soil, learn about regenerative farming practices, take those practices back to where they're from. More people are growing food than ever before. We're starting to see victory gardens pop up. Uh, people are looking for opportunities to learn sustainable food production. And I think that the Emerald Triangle is one of the most amazing places to learn about that. Oh, and it also happens to have some of the best cannabis in the world. So I think Flocana right. would really like to see the marrying of those two you know, interest groups, especially given that the farmers we work with, so many of them, if not most or all of them, are growing food in addition to cannabis and are using regenerative methods. And so there's so much that folks can learn just because of their interest in cannabis. They can come away learning about integrated pest management and good soil health and water reclamation, which is something that they may have come up never expecting to learn about and thinking that they were just going to go tour a really cool cannabis farm. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to take this opportunity as well to talk about the product makers and the alchemists. And it's like there's the communities that rally around not just the cultivation, but all the different kind of disciplines and specific craft that that has evolved because of that. I think that's also inc an incredibly unmined well when it comes to a traveler wanting to experience that. I will also say as someone who's traveled myself that when I go up to Mendocino and Humboldt, I truly have that aesthetic as if I visited a foreign country, and that is absolutely a compliment. It is a really unique culture with an immense, the, the presence of nature is really intense, and the way people think and talk and act, and it's, it really kind of scratches that itch as an international traveler. And I think it's amazing that we have, you know, this region that offers that, that happens to also grow world-class cannabis, and it all goes back to, when you start watching the the kind of the movement from the hippie movement to the back to the land and understanding kind of the solar and all those things that tie into the to living off the grid i mean it's a really fascinating experience so I'm oh, absolutely. 
So we have a tour operator from Brazil and who would like to know what's the best way to convince regular tourists. Uh, what's the best way you think this, okay, I'm going to translate this a little bit. What's the best <laughs> way you think to draw tourists from, because obviously this is a great question because it speaks to multi markets and their role in tourism. And the question essentially is how do we speak to tourists that arrive in LA or SF and draw them up to the Emerald triangle and work collaboratively with these kind of gateway cities? Well, I think that, you know, again, it's not just the cannabis, right? So there's a lot of things that folks are looking to do nowadays when they travel. They don't want to necessarily go to one location and just sit there. They're looking to have different experiences. So I think putting packages together that include Emerald Triangle related experiences like white, you know, river rafting and hiking and biking and um, camping and, you know, stargazing and foraging and, you know, mushroom hunting. Mushroom and hunting, all these yeah. really Interesting things that are really great in the Emerald Triangle. And you pair that with a cannabis experience, um, then you're, you're kind of a, a step above all the other tour companies that aren't doing the cannabis experiences and that are just packaging everything else. So one of the things we did last November pre-COVID, which seems like a million years ago, uh, but we had a mushroom feast at Solar Living Center, and we did um, some CBD and mushroom cocktails, not psychedelic mushrooms yet, uh, cocktails, and then we did an infused dinner, and Emerald Farm Tours brought up a group, and it made it part of a Mendocino weekend. So, you know, there was a craft beer festival going on that weekend. There was the tours of the Redwoods that were available. You know, they stayed at a great location that was in the middle of a forest. Um, they went to the coast, which is like a whole other world than inland in Mendocino. Right. So I right. really think it's about not just focusing on one particular experience, but trying to create a package that speaks to a grand experience. And the pull to the Emerald Triangle is that it's just a very unique place geographically, visually. As you said, it feels like you're in another country. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm looking out my window right now, and I kid you not, there is a gigantic rainbow that's stretching across the entire valley as I sit here and talk <laughs> to you. And that's like a daily occurrence. So there is yeah. something really special about being up here. Um, that will appeal to folks who want to experience all sides of California. All right, Amanda, one more question we had come in asking about tour companies specifically and what can they expect when engaging with farms that are also enthusiastic about tourism? What are maybe three to five tips you have on how to facilitate those kind of partnerships for tour companies? Well, um, so a couple things for tour companies that I found they, that were a little bit confused confusing in the last couple of years. So cannabis is a seasonal plant and it's an annual. So it's not like grapevines where even when the plant isn't fruiting, it's still in the ground and looking like cool. There's nothing in the ground. So, you know, I would have tour companies that would want to go visit farms in like January or February and they're just people are going to be disappointed um, because you, you have so you want to manage expectations, you know, and folks who come up to see farms want to see gigantic eight foot cannabis plants like that's what they want. That's what that's like the money shot. Right. So mm -hmm. thinking about whether farms that you're working with have that to offer and what do they have to offer from a visual perspective? Um, what do they have to offer that's unique? So, for example, I'll call out Johnny Casali because I saw him <laughs> on here at Huckleberry. So they are a fish friendly farm, um, which is great. It's so cool. They have this big pond. It's got a bunch of fish. So like that's a unique aspect to their farm. That is a selling point for for tour companies. So I would say, you know, be really clear with the farmer about what they've got going on and what are the expectations of your group. And then, you know, be very respectful about what the farmer's protocols are. And mm -hmm. you might say, hey, they're asking us to do X. I know the law doesn't require that. Do it anyway. This is their farm. They're under huge, huge stress to bring a clean product to market. And that clean product is going to be worth way more to them than your one tour person who decided that they wanted to touch all the plants. So just be very respectful and recognize that the farmer really needs to lead. Um, and the tour company is there to kind of be a observer of the process. Um, 
And then finally, think about what else there is around the farm and how easy it is to get to farms. So, you know, some farms are beautiful, but they are a 20 minute drive on a gravel road up the side of a mountain. And so as a tour company, think about who's your clientele, how comfortable are they going to be with getting out and walking around in the dirt? Or would they rather visit a place, you know, that is a little bit, you know, less gritty? Um, so really matching who your clientele is with what the farm experience is. But again, it really all starts and ends with the farmer and what they feel comfortable with and how they would like to showcase their farm to the public. Amazing. Thank you so much, Amanda, for the insight. I think the one other thing I want to mention while we're on this topic is I'm very excited for the curing process to become um, as compelling and people become more aware of all the really unique, you know, farmer to farmer craft of how you not how you harvest and actually cure cannabis. Um, oh, yeah. People are going to pay to trim weed. I was talking about this oh, earlier yeah. today. Folks, they, they pay to stomp grapes. They will absolutely pay to trim bud and take it with them. <laughs> so, you know, that whole, you know, pick your own, trim your own model is I see it as a being a very, very lucrative future. All right. Thanks, Amanda. We're going to move on to the next slide. Bye. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, everyone. So the next slide is about the impact of COVID-19, which we all know has had an absolutely devastating effect on the tourism and travel industry for the nation, not just California. You'll notice that some of these data points are from the national lens, and it's because it is an all hands on deck situation from hotels to airlines to DMOs. Um, it The bottom has dropped out and uh, I, I, I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the amazing work and be and witnessing the work that U.S. Travel, Destinations International, Civitas, MMGY, California, uh, Cal Travel, Visit California, the California Hotel and Lodging Association have been relentless in coming together and providing amazing information and insights that are really week by week on all this. Um, so this slide, though, obviously shows that it has been devastating for the travel industry. Five hundred and nineteen billion decline in spending in the U.S. this year with a total economic loss of one point two trillion. Um, you know, it shows the gravity of the situation at hand. Uh, and with that, I'll move to the next slide so we could talk about the next phase we're moving into. So this next slide talks about the most recent research um, for the tourism and travel industry. So the data shows that, you know, people are looking at road trips, they're looking to travel to destinations closer to home, and will likely be wanting to drive. And that's going to be at least Q2, two, three, and, and most of four. Um, you're looking at the drive market or drive-in visitation um, for the tourism and travel industry here in California, as well as nationwide and probably around the world. Um, in recent polls, 79% of travelers say that they will change their travel plans over the next six months, um, probably shifting a lot of that away from airlines even more so toward, toward drive. And 55% say the pandemic will greatly impact the travel currently. So um, the good news on the last uh, data point is um, and the week ending in May 2nd, the travel economy witnessed its first expansion in nine weeks. Um, it's still registered pretty low compared to last year, but um, it shows that it's hopefully starting to turn in, in the right direction and, and, and kind of correct course. All right, so now we're at the education pillar for the CCTA, and really we're going to focus in now on traveling in the age of COVID-19. Um, we're going to do two or three slides that are dedicated to this. So in short, those who adapt will survive and eventually thrive. Health and safety is top of mind for everybody. And, you know, the quote, necessity is the mother of, of invention or innovation. And really the need is to be safe and feel safe. And that's where we all need to be highly focused and, and adapting um, and right now for, for this next phase. Um, you know, technology is gonna become more of an amenity um, than, than it was uh, prior to COVID-19. Um, the less human interaction is going to be perceived as a better guest experience in the short term, for sure. And I think the long term is to be determined. Um, so travelers are expecting high touch, high tech protocols, health related products and procedures, hand sanitizers, disinfectants, face masks, health checks, 
So things need to be adapted and evolve into something that is low touch, um, that embraces the social distancing model and really is a prevention plan for, for, for COVID-19. Um, nearly two in three travelers say that if the travel economy doesn't take health considerations seriously, they are likely to withhold future purpose, uh, purchases. So again, that communicates to any business at the intersection of, of, of travel and cannabis or at the travel industry in general, um, that adopting and adapting right now is, is incredibly important. I wanna point out the travel in the new normal. This document is one of the, I think one of the most thorough, well put together publications I've seen come out uh, from US travel. That is also gonna be in the Slack channel that you will all be invited to join if you, if you would like. Um, and that goes into much more detail of kind of uh, what businesses can do to adapt to the current landscape. Um, okay, so health and safety, develop and promote a gold standard COVID-19 prevention plan. Number one is create transmission barriers to adopt, adapt operations, modify employee practices and redesign public spaces to help protect employees and customers. Number two is enhance your sanitation. Travel business should adopt and implement enhanced sanitation procedures specifically designed to combat the transmission of COVID-19 and also promote health screening. Um, measures for employees, isolate them if they feel sick, symptoms, and be able to provide health resources to your employees. Um, a couple of the bullet points on the right hand side speak to screening process for temperature or doing an onboarding kind of brief three question Q&A. How are you feeling? Have you been around somebody with COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I saw an interesting suggestion of se uh, safety as an amenity. We're actually creating an amenity bag that includes gloves, hand sanitizer, and face masks that let's say it is a tour company or a hotel guest that they are provided upon arrival that is part of um, the service that they get um, engaging with your business. And also understanding what your third party suppliers are doing and what their safety measures are currently. Um, so you can really look at your supply chain and know that it's, it's, it's a thoughtful uh, kind of new model that speaks to the pandemic that we're in the midst of. Okay, um, this is the marketing and communication front. So once you have your SOPs and your standards recalibrated, um, it's really being able to communicate that gold standard for safety. Um, communicate it to your employees, communicate it to your customers, and let them know that you are taking the appropriate measures to make sure that they are safe and they feel safe and they are safe. You need to be sensitive in your communication and be not sure to overstep. You wanna build trust. Um, you know, data suggests that travelers are ready to hear about travel now, that we have hopefully bottomed out and now they're ready to start slightly considering what the next trip is. So to approach them in a thoughtful and empathetic way, um, is, a, is kind of a good messaging strategy for now with a call to action that needs to be conveyed very carefully, um, but can exist at this point. We're past crisis mode, um, as the data is showing. So having a careful call to action um, built into your messaging is now possible. But being able to communicate your gold standards of what procedures you've implemented, your amenity bag, um, uh, and use that in your marketing and communication um, going forward. Um, also, you know, the data consistently shows that drive market visitors are going to be this phase one, which is not shocking. Most people are going to want to stay close to home. I've seen a few different kind of mileage recommendations throughout all the webinars I've been on in the past uh, eight, eight to nine weeks, um, and they average out to about 125 miles. Uh, from your place of business. So as far as targeted marketing, that would be who you want to be looking at and trying to reach. So this slide is about B2B talking points. With cannabis, hemp, and CBD being as confusing and exciting as it is, um, there's really four talking points here that I want to communicate to everybody about why cannabis is a tourism asset. Um, the first one is cannabis is essential, and this was recently designated here in California. Now, a lot of the conversation right now in the travel and tourism industry is around being open to rethinking the framework of the funding of the destination marketing organizations and, and how the ecosystem helps to fund the marketing for any destination, whether it's Mendocino, San Diego, or LA. And cannabis being an essential service 
is an interesting evolution because that means that as far as a funding source through an assessment, that cannabis is arguably a bit more stable than other businesses that have not been deemed essential. So the fact that cannabis is essential is a new, is, is possibly something to consider as we developed uh, the new marketing funding framework and being inclusive of, of essential businesses like cannabis to provide stability. So that's the first talking point. The second talking point is travelers are interested from cannabis with THC to the CBD infused topical massage from that's hemp derived. You know, it's new and it's exciting and it's growth markets. It's continuing to trend. All the data shows that economically and, and with consumer interest. And it promotes well-being, which was one of kind of the key trends that was here even prior to COVID-19 in the travel and tourism industry is this sense of wellness and being a conscious traveler and having low impact on when you travel. And cannabis ticks a lot of those boxes, being a medicine and being something that promotes well-being. Cannabis can really kind of find its place in the California experience. Um, so whether it's a CBD infused massage for a destination or for your business, you know, you could speak to whatever consumer you're trying to reach, the audiences are there. The third talking point is cannabis is collaborative. You know, cannabis tourism is a tide that lifts all boats in the tourism ecosystem of a destination. And the reason why is because cannabis is effects based. So having cannabis, you know, at the right dose, 30 minutes or an hour or even 20 minutes, if you're inhaling it prior to a dining experience is going to amplify and enhance that experience to make it more memorable. And the same thing with creative pursuits, museums, art exhibits. So cannabis has this ability to really have amazing collaborative partners in their destination and create bundled packages in ways that are really supplemental to breathing life and increased spending in other businesses that are part of that tourism ecosystem. Um, or for example, um, on this slide, I put, you know, a live music show with cannabis is different than without. And then it comes down to dosing and making sure you dose it correctly, just like with alcohol. You don't want to have too much, you want to have the right amount. The fourth talking point is cannabis is a tourism asset. It's, it's new and exciting. And these cannabis related products, services and experiences are not maximized and they're economic drivers. So between those four talking points, I urge you to engage with your local community, um, with your local government and to start communicating the value of CBD, hemp and cannabis tourism and start identifying assets or develop an asset yourself or continue to polish your cannabis business to be a valued asset as part of the tourism ecosystem of your destination. All right, so three key takeaways. If we were to have to distill this down into three key takeaways, number one is drive market visitation. So adopt your model to really target the drive-in visitor. Number two is health and safety. You need to recalibrate from employees to customers and communicate that extremely effectively um, in your marketing communications, which leads to number three, to engage and educate. So once you have your new health and safety kind of COVID-19 landscape um, operations implemented, um, to be able to educate and engage through marketing or through advocacy to your local government or to your potential customers, what you have done to respond as a business to be able to continue to function in a safe way um, in today's, uh, today's, today's landscape. All right, so this touches a bit back on resources that I've mentioned um, in the Slack channel that we've created uh, that everybody is gonna be able to access. Um, this is the CCTA open resource Slack channel. Um, we're starting to kind of file things under hashtags, financial research, marketing and advocacy. Um, yet again, I want to thank all the logos that are on this slide and beyond. I mean, I, it's been such an amazing thing to witness the travel industry come together at, from the national level to the state level um, to provide quality information and real-time data um, as we navigate this very strange time. Um, there's publications that have been selected and uploaded to that Slack channel from different organizations that we felt really spoke to our membership base. Um, so you can find that on the Slack channel if you decide to join. And we will continue adding to that as we, as we further go into this rebound and recovery phase of the travel industry. 
Um, the CCTA does have a bi-monthly newsletter, which you will all be getting. You could easily opt out of it if you would not like to receive it. The newsletter will be going out in uh, June, August, October, and December. So basically the off months from the virtual events, you'll be getting a CCTA newsletter. Um, in that newsletter, you will see what the July date is for the next virtual event. Um, also, I want to take this opportunity to talk about a new initiative that's coming together this year for the CCTA, which is the first annual um, California Cannabis Tourism Report uh, published by the CCTA. And we have a couple contributing, different contributing organizations and companies that are going to be part of that. Um, we also are conducting our own research, which Amanda alluded to earlier on. Um, we do plan on publishing this in August. Um, and it's going to be a comprehensive overview of the state of cannabis tourism in California. So we look forward to that. Um, we're going to cross our fingers and shoot for July so we can include those insights. And that could be a big part of our next virtual event. Um, but we've set it for no later than August. And you'll get updates in the newsletter and on the Slack channel about that. All right. So this is the um, second to last slide. And really, it's just a recap of five kind of key points that we covered through this presentation. Uh, one is through the end of 2020, most of our services and virtual events are available to anybody interested in cannabis tourism and the CCTA. Please feel free to share this with your network and invite anybody that you think would find this interesting or valuable. Um, I mentioned that it's in mid-July. Jared Kylo will be on our next uh, virtual event. He'll be featured as Amanda was today. Um, I mentioned that you are going to be receiving the bi-monthly newsletter and you can opt out if you want, if you'd like to. You will also be receiving an invite, an invite to join that Slack channel that I've kept referring to, referring to throughout this presentation called the Open Resource Slack channel of the CCTA. Um, that will include all kinds of resources and information and research. And final reminder that the CCTA Cannabis Tourism Summit will take place on November 19th in San Francisco at Hotel Zeppelin. So please mark your calendars and we hope to see you all there in person um, and hopefully get a break from the virtual event space. Um, and with that, we can move on to the last slide and possibly take a couple questions. We have about 12 to 13 minutes left here. Oh, before we do that, I wanna you know, thank Yvonne Brown and Event High. This, this presentation would not have happened without either of them. Um, Yvonne's company is LCA Travel and Events. I highly recommend it. She's a pro, she's organized, and it's been an honor working with you on this, Yvonne. Um, also, Event High for providing the platform and working with someone like me who's technologically challenged to try to coach me to be able to do this. Um, thank you both for your effort and hard work, and I really, really appreciate it. The CCTA board really appreciates it. So thank you for that. If you have any questions, you can email me, brian at cannabistourismca.org, or hit me up in the Slack channel. And also one final thank you to all the different travel organizations that have been providing these webinars and these white papers and this research over the last nine weeks. It's been really, eye-opening, um, really understanding how, seeing the community come together, the travel industry come together and, and, and support each other through this. So on that note, I'm gonna take a look and see if we have any questions. All right, one question is, does anyone have any idea on how to monetize virtual cannabis travel? This is a great question, especially right now. You know, if there's anybody, any brands, any companies that are sitting on digital content that hasn't been maximized, um, I think that's part of reaching your customer and folding in your COVID-19 messaging strategy um, in tandem with this uh, content. Uh, one of the recent kind of uh, audiences that I spoke to, the enthusiasm of seeing a cannabis grow and experiencing what a tour would be like uh, was a very high interest and brought a lot of smiles to people's faces in the room. So I think having bite-sized video or photographs with storytelling Perhaps, uh, you know, getting on a on an interview, maybe you interview one of your past passengers so they could story tell about the experience as you show photographs, um, you know, and can you monetize it? I think, I mean, I, again, technologically challenged. I don't understand fully the ad space and things like that, but I know that there's, if you get the right amount of traffic, you can through, through advertising and marketing. Um, also just straight entry fee. If you have a 30 minute experience with a Q and A with a cultivator, 
perhaps people are willing to pitch up five bucks to be able to access that, especially if it's somebody who is well recognized or an influencer in the cannabis space or is doing something very unique. Um, when I was speaking over in Europe last year, there's definitely California cultivators and breeders that are well known internationally. Um, a lot of them are right up here from Northern California, Swami Select, Frenchy Cannoli. Um, you know, uh, there's um, uh, Kevin Jodry. I mean, there was a handful of people that kept getting asked about when I was over there. So I would look at people in cannabis who are the thought leaders of their respective craft and potentially there's a collaboration there. Um, this next question is, can you share your thoughts about cannabis Appalachians and cannabis tourism? I look at cannabis Appalachians as one of the key pieces of infrastructure for the state of California for California cannabis tourism. Um, I think the Appalachians are going to give us that foundation to be able to market from and be able to give these small legacy farmers a platform to speak to their craft and their, and their small batch kind of Northern California grown cannabis. So the Appalachians is going to be an all tides rise kind of play as that comes in. Um, and that's going to become a key tourism asset for the state of California to draw visitation. Humboldt and Mendocino both already have brand equity internationally as the best cultivation spots or, or growers um, in the world. So it's how do we build off of that? How do we take the, the brand equity of the Emerald Triangle, of Humboldt, of Mendocino? How do we fold it into a way where it really fits into the California brand? And we do it in a way that's based in wellness, in nature, that's, that allows for story, storytelling about Californians and, and how we did it and why we did it and all the values that, that kind of go along with that story. Um, so I think the Appalachians is an incredible platform for obviously place of origin, but also a platform to tell about life under prohibition, just like the tunnels in Chicago or in New Braunfels, Texas, where they used to smuggle alcohol from you know bar to bar, restaurant to restaurant. When, when alcohol was illegal. So we've got a lot of interesting storytelling to mine. And I think the Appalachians first and foremost will be about terroir and quality. But when you start listening to the stories of the people that are the fabric of the culture up there, um, it, it's just a well of, of incredible storytelling. Do one more question. So this one is, how can I become involved as a volunteer support CCTA as an individual, not a business? That's a great question. Um, uh, please email me. We are forming committees. Uh, we are constantly growing this model and looking for people who are enthusiastic about the cannabis tourism opportunity for our state and for your local market. Um, we have discussed kind of having uh, other, you know, sub associations around the state. Um, so if you have an interest, please email me directly. Tell me more about yourself. Let me know what your interest is and what you're passionate about as an individual. There's a lot of ways to get involved from content to support. We are a 501c6 nonprofit um, and we work hard as an organization to really help steward this evolution of cannabis tourism in California. The more hands on deck, the better. So come in, come with passion we'll find a spot. And, uh, and if you are a business, our membership, typically, of course, it's open to everybody through year end. Most of our, most of our membership services are open to, to anyone through year end. We have a couple that will not be. Um, but in a typical year, the memberships start at $250 for a year membership for businesses with 25 employees or less. For those with 25 employees or more, it goes up. Obviously, it's $5,000 a year. We want brands that really value the tourism opportunity and are going to engage with the travel industry of the state and become models and examples of, of how cannabis tourism will evolve and is evolving. Um, and we're really excited to get as many people involved as are willing and, and doing this together where we can all have really healthy communication so we can make this everything that it should be uh, for California as a, as a tourism asset. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more. So this one was, do you provide education on how to start a tourism association to other states? The answer is currently no, but we have been contacted by kind of tourism, cannabis tourism thought leaders in other countries, as well as other states that are very interested in what we're doing and wanting to expand. 
Um, so if you're interested in discussing that and perhaps helping steward that, we do have a model that we've been working on since November 2017 when we started. And we had a lot of learnings in that time. We have a lot of great information in that time um, that we've banked. And it would be a great initiative to start thinking about how do we expand, how do we get this into other states, and how do we support each other and trade information. And the last question I'm going to answer is, if the social distancing goes on for a year, how can we bring people into our venues? That's a great question. I think it is the social distancing model. I think that there's a place for it, to be honest. I, I, I believe that there's certain travelers that are ready to have a bit more space and and have it be in less crowded areas and to have these exclusive experiences, whether it's in a retail shop or whether, you know, it's having tables spaced six to eight feet apart um, or whether it's, you know, a nature experience like Amanda spoke about um, where there's plenty of wide open spaces in nature. So I think it's really getting creative and understanding that social distancing model and, and traveling in the age of COVID-19 is, is a very unique landscape, but it's, it also opens up opportunities to innovate and differentiate. And as long as you're willing to adapt and really dream about your model and a different version of it, um, I think it's all about that kind of ingenuity and creativity and then being able to adequately market and message about that uh, to your customers. And lastly, I'll say, you know, cannabis tourism is very new. You know, it includes CBD, it includes hemp. You know, hemp can replace plastics and paper. CBD is non-psychoactive and it's pretty much every spa now has a CBD infused massage. And then of course you have the cannabis, the licensed regulated cannabis industry with THC consumption. So this is a very new space and we all have the responsibility to educate each other on the travel industry side, as well as the cannabis side, because it's through healthy conversation and discussion that we can really steward this forward. And there's models where you don't have to have inhalation. You don't have to have high THC products. Maybe you're a hotel. I had a hotel in Sacramento contact me about eight months ago that simply wanted to understand how they could implement hemp into their hotel to raise the level of sustainability that they're currently operating at. So it's a very exciting space with a lot of different conversations to be had. I just encourage all of you to engage. Um, and finally, just thanks again for being here. What a great turnout. We look forward to hopefully seeing all of you in July. Um, you'll be getting those emails, newsletters, the invites to the Slack channel. And thank you all so much for showing up and being interested. Look forward to next one. Thank you.